Hey, welcome to Financial Markets and Institutions. This video will provide a brief history of the United States from a money and financial markets and institutions perspective. It'll show that the U.S. went through centuries of monetary instability, which means it also went through centuries of economic instability. We'll motivate the rest of the course and show you that the financial system composed of financial institutions, markets, and instruments, including money, is vital to the economy. A stable currency is key. This course is really cool. I've been studying economics and finance since the early 1980s, going on almost four decades. I went through and experienced the high inflation that we had in this country and the economic turmoil of the 1970s. I remember that. It wasn't fun. And so I was quite interested in learning where the financial markets were at the time. I wanted to know what was most, what was most up to date, you know, what was happening in the markets. I really wasn't interested in history, let alone economic history and financial market history. But it turns out, after years of studying this, I realized that you can't begin to understand our financial markets and institutions without dipping back in history a bit to see why these policies and instruments and methods were implemented in the first place. What happened that caused our financial system to look like it does today? That's really interesting. And so when you understand a bit of the history, you'll be in much better shape in appreciating where we are today. So to make it clear, this course is not a history course. But I'm going to start off talking about some history to show you where we came from. Occasionally, we'll dip back and talk about history. But for the most part, we're going to talk about current economic events. But darned if I can talk about current economic events without talking about some history. So the course is not a history course, but it kind of embeds some in there. So let's move on a bit more about what this video covers. This video will highlight an important fact that you may not know. Any well-developed country must have a well-developed financial system of institutions and markets. Can you find a country that's well-developed without a well-developed financial system? You're not going to do it. Basically, a well-developed financial system is a prerequisite for a well-developed country and an economy. This video will also discuss the functions of money, which are the unit of account, means of payment, and store of value. We'll relate each of these functions to the U.S. experience of volatile price levels that we went through. We'll compare and contrast a low inflationary environment to a high inflationary environment using these functions of money. Then we'll discuss whether Bitcoin, a relatively recent invention, fulfills the three functions of money. Interesting, right? Current events here. And then what we'll do is we'll look at the money supply. We'll look at M1 and M2. We'll look at actual numbers and information and graphs from Fed, the Federal Reserve, economic database that's out there. Fred, Federal Reserve Economic Database. So before we go further, let's take a look at some information we have. It goes back to into the 1860s. I'm going to go further. I'm, in a minute, I'm going to go back to the 1600s. But we, we have better data in the 1800s than we do in the 1600s. And so what we have here is a graph of the aggregate price level. And normally, when you look at an aggregate price level today, it, it increases slowly, at least for the U.S., I should say. It increases slowly and ramps up. Here you have a roller coaster of an aggregate price level. And before we go further, what the heck's an aggregate price level? Well, think of it as a, an, a weighted average of a basket of goods, the costs of a basket of goods that you face. So you have housing costs, you have you know, automobile, transportation costs, food costs, and weight those costs. And just cost, just the prices associated with that. Just keep track of the prices. Keep everything else the same, the quantity and the quality of those goods, and keep track of the prices over time. Think of that as the aggregate price level. So here we have the aggregate price level for the U.S. It's been pieced together. We didn't, you know, back then nobody kept track of aggregate price levels. The concept wasn't even around at the time. So people had to piece this together. Now take a look again at the graph. You first of all, you're going to see a lot of gray bars. The gray bars, look at that as just total pain. That was depressions and recession, recessions that took place throughout that time period. And the thing you grasp from this is, holy mackerel, look at all those recessions relative to, you know, some economic growth, which is the white bars there. The white bars are, you know, 
I should say their economic growth, but it could literally be stagnation of, of no growth, basically. It's better than, than negative growth. But recessions are and depressions are negative economic growth. And so we'd come out of a recession, we'd stagnate or maybe grow a bit, only to fall right back into a recession or a depression. And a lot of that had to do with our financial system or lack of understanding of our financial system and the lack of regulation of it. And so that's what this course is going to talk about. Now, let's look closely at the graph. It starts off in 1860, around the Civil War time. So as you're going to hear again and again in this video and, and as you go through the course, that when the government goes into war, and the U.S. government, and this even applies to European governments, they go through wars, they need to issue money to pay for it. They don't have enough money. And what you find is that, you know, what, how do governments finance the war? Well, they could tax people, and that's generally not acceptable to increase taxes during a war. You can issue debt, but you can only issue so much debt, and then people don't have confidence in the debt. Or you can kind of work behind the scenes and start issuing money, printing money, and using that to pay for supplies for the war. The problem with printing money, increasing the money supply, is that eventually the money becomes worthless. You have too much money floating around in the economy. And the only thing that changes is prices. Prices go up and the value of a dollar is much less. So that's what you see in the early 1860s. You see a ramp up in the aggregate price level. That means there's a ramp up of inflation. And then the government goes off of, of the gold standard. We'll talk a little bit of that. But the gold standard is usually used to, to mean, usually implies that, look, there's gold on reserve at banks and financial institutions that back up the paper currency. So you always have the ability to convert your paper currency in the gold reserves or maybe even silver reserves. That way people will have confidence in the paper that's floating around in the economy. But when you start printing too much money, the money's not backed up by very much gold anymore. And so the U.S. went off the gold standard way back in the 1860s and it went back on it and back off it and we went into what's called bimetallism for a period of time where we, we had both a gold and a silver standard. So now look at, let's back to the, the graph here. We see the great sag where we had the second industrial revolution. Wages were up, however, but look at prices sagging. And then right before World War I, or right around World War I, we see a tremendous increase in the price level. Well, again, that's the increasing of the money supply and prices going up because of that to pay for the war. And then, um, you know, we see a Great Depression and then, you know, a few more bars. Now, we'll look at a much, much more recent financial data later on in the course. But I'm giving you, again, a background for the reason for understanding financial markets and institutions. What this tells you is nobody knew what the heck to do from a financial markets and institutions perspective in the 1800s, in the early 1900s. Nobody knew. Look at it. Okay. Let's move forward and actually go back a little bit further in time. In the 16 and 1700s, people arrived in America to a very primitive environment. They had some coins in their possession for trade, but most trade was, was through barter. And the problem with barter is you need a double coincidence at once. If you have chickens and you want some beef, you're going to have to find somebody who has beef but also wants chicken and wants to, to trade. That's called the double coincidence of once. It means that you spend most of your time trying to find somebody to trade with. And you may have to find a third party to trade with to make it easier. Money, if we had it, would be so much more easier to, to transact business as we see today. And so people take it for granted. Well, what I'm telling you is don't necessarily take it for granted. Understand it a bit. And that's where this history comes into play. So basically, in the 1600s, 1700s, we had no financial infrastructure. There were very, very few banks at the time. Now, let's go further here. In 1690, Massachusetts issued the first government paper in the U.S. It was denominated in pounds, British pounds, to pay soldiers to buy supplies. <laughs> Already, 1690, we see Massachusetts, the government, issuing paper money to pay for a war. Just like what happened in European countries 
years before. And so this was nothing new. The people of Massachusetts knew and were suspicious of such issuance of paper. And what happened is almost always in these situations, it becomes too easy to print paper and governments overprint and you end up getting inflation. People knew that. And in 1692, Massachusetts had to make the currency legal tender, which means you were forced to take it as part of a transaction. So you were forced to take the payment of that paper money. So let's look at Gresham's Law now. The reason why I put it in here and cover it is that we see examples of Gresham's Law happening throughout history. And what it means is it predicts that good money is chased out by bad money. And so we've had a long history where paper money, which was very suspicious, people looked at very suspicious, was often overprinted, it had no intrinsic value whatsoever, coinciding with coins, gold and silver coins, which had intrinsic value. Gold and silver had value going back centuries and centuries. And so you had, you had suspicious paper money and you had gold and silver coins. And it turns out in a lot of situations, even when you had legal tender requirements, that people would transact in the paper currency and put in their pocket the gold and silver because the gold and silver was worth more than the paper money. And so if you were required to trade and to accept paper money as legal tender, people pocketed the gold and the silver. A more recent example of Gresham's Law is this. In 1965, the U.S. switched from dimes and quarters, which were composed of 90% silver, to copper and nickel clad coins. So we switched over in the mid-60s, the copper and clad coins that you see today. The silver coins immediately disappeared from circulation. So people realized that four quarters, for example, were worth far more than a paper dollar. So the coins went in people's drawers and people transacted in paper money, and, and then they, actually, they also transacted in these clad coins. And incidentally, the Coinage Act of 1965 made U.S. coins legal tender. Before that, coins were not legal tender because they had silver and people just accepted them. They knew they had value. But now, government was worried that, you know, people may not accept copper nickel clad coins. And so the Coinage Act of 1965 made it legal tender, and basically forced people to accept it as payment. Now, let's move on. In the 1770s, England had substantial troops in America. The colonies desperately wanted to succeed from England. Out of necessity, they formed the Continental Congress to put up a united front. But many did not want to fight a war against the tyrant only to form another overbearing government internally. Economically, there was no single uniform currency, only three commercial banks and no central bank at the time. So in colonial times, we had a hodgepodge of currencies. Each state had their own currency, and then each bank, if, if they existed, issued currency, paper money. And so we had no uniform currency. Europe, on the other hand, had uniform currencies like the pound, and those coin, their coins and their money often circulated in America at a premium to American money. So you had, you had literally, at the time, you had 13 colonies, and most of them were issuing money, and the money looked different from each state, and the money changed, changed its appearance over time. It looked different, different denominations. So when you transacted business and somebody handed you over a, a, a Connecticut dollar, you would look at it, paper dollar, you'd look at it, you'd be like, is this really, tr you know, real? And so counterfeit paper circulated all over the, the, the economy at the time. And it turned out, like I said, there was a substantial premium for European money, especially Spanish dollars and gold coins and silver coins relative to local currency and paper. Now, the Continental Congress did not issue paper currency until 1775, called Continentals. The reason for the issuance was, was obvious. George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, among others, fought the Revolutionary War for years. They had very little supplies. 
And so they needed money to be able to buy these supplies. It turned out that the Continental Congress ended up printing millions of dollars at the time, millions. And so the paper became worthless, and a lot of local farmers would not accept it. And so the, so the Continental Army that we had basically was undersupplied, while the British, who had silver golden coins in this country, ended up buying a lot of supplies from local farmers in our country. Now, why did the government issue all, all these Continentals, this currency? Well, they had trouble taxing the states. Support for the war varied among the states, and some states issued debt. After the war, the need to pay off the debt burdened the country. Too many Continentals were issued, inflation spiked, as I said. Foreign currency and coins traded at a premium the Continentals, which became nearly worthless. The Spanish dollar be, was so popular at the time that the term dollar was adopted as the national currency in 1792 in our country. So after the Revolutionary War, Hamilton pushed for a centralized financial system composed of a U.S. Treasury to finance the government, and he also pushed for the first central bank to help the U.S. government transact its business. According to Hamilton, it seemed like transactions were bogged down by the fact there simply was not enough currency, good currency, in our markets. All these observations pointed to a need of having a treasury and a good central bank. So a good part of this course is about central banking. Hamilton also envisioned a U.S. treasury that could handle the central government's finances, especially the issuance of debt. Why was he anxious to issue debt, and why were so many fearful of the idea? Well, people were fearful of having too much centralized debt because they thought, well, then there's too much control over the people and over the country, and we'd fall back to basically having another dominating government like England. So taxes were unpopular, and he wanted a central government. So don't underestimate the fear that people had in this country early on about central authority. So in seeking a U.S. Treasury, Many feared Hamilton wanted a permanent amount of debt, and they thought, wow, a permanent amount of debt means that we would be shackled to some central authority because we'd have to constantly have to pay off that debt. Furthermore, many feared that the creation of a strong central authority in and of itself was a problem, and that's what a U.S. Treasury represented. And in the end, a balance of power was struck. There was power given to the states and some power given to a centralized authority, you know, a U.S. Treasury and a central bank. And to this day, there's still what's called a dual banking system, where there's a state banking system and a national banking system, which we'll discuss later on in this course. The fear of centralized power had its impact on the first central banks of this country, and I say banks with a plural, because we started two central banks in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, and each bank was authorized for a 20-year period and then was to be renewed by Congress at a later point. Well, in both instances, the central bank was allowed to lapse. It was never renewed. And so we had a central bank that started in 1791. That's the first central bank. And that ended in 1811. And then uh, economic chaos ensued. And so in 1816, we started up another central bank, and that lasted until 1833, and it was never renewed. So the fight over centralization and a central authority was big back then. People just did not trust central banks. They didn't trust banks, and they didn't trust central banks, even more so. So what happened during this time period from 1791 in, all the way into the eight, middle 1800s is that the states continued to print too much money, especially when they ran into budget shortfalls. And not only that, commercial banks were started, hundreds of commercial banks, and they issued paper also, currency. So there was hundreds of different kinds of state and commercial bank currency floating around in the economy. And so people would be presented with very strange looking paper, and they wouldn't really know if it was, if it was good or not. It slowed down commerce. Now let's look at the Panic of 1837 because this has a bearing on things that we're going to talk about later in the course. Not per se this particular event, but this event sounds similar to what we're going to see later on. After the second central bank of the U.S. lapsed in 1833, inflation ramped up as the money supply increased. The U.S. The US expansion in agriculture and canals 
you know, basically transportation, was being funded by European money, which is relatively more stable than our money. Many states have substantial amounts of debt that was purchased by the Europeans. And in 1837, the Bank of England tightened credit. And tightening credit means they increased interest rates, which made the price of borrowing more expensive. It tends to lead to a contraction in the economy, as we'll see over and over again in this course. Well, when Bank of England increased interest rates, it led to the panic of 1837. U.S. economic activity collapsed. Nine states defaulted or renegotiated on their debt as a result of the depression, depression, not recession, that had followed. In a nutshell, U.S. monetary policy as we know it today did not exist. You may not have a good understanding of what U.S. monetary policy is in, to begin with, but that's the whole purpose of this course. I mean, that's an important component of this course. So hold on, we'll cover it. The state struggled with frequently with overprinting money because there was no single authority to print money. You had, this, you had multiple states, hundreds of commercial banks issuing paper. No wonder things didn't work very well. So what happened was we had panics, we had booms, and we had busts that plagued this country all too frequently. And in the meantime, the country went on and off the gold standard and sometimes employed bimetallism. Bimetallism is where a currency is directly or indirectly redeemable into both gold and silver. And so we've moved away from me any metallism in this country. We have pure fiat money. It's not backed by gold anywhere. So you have to have confidence in the U.S. government, which is why Things like Bitcoin have popped up, and we'll talk about that towards the end of this video. Bitcoin has popped up as an alternative to, to government-based money. Now let's get back to history. In 1862, the Civil War costs skyrocketed, and the federal government attempted to issue debt to pay for the war, but there was not enough demand for the debt, and they couldn't tax either. Remember, taxes, taxing was quite difficult. The, so what happened was the government then outlawed state issuance of bank notes and created greenbacks. So in 1862, you finally see this country getting a uniform central currency called greenbacks. They were called greenbacks because the reverse side of the dollars were, were green. And so what they did was they outlawed state issuance of bank notes and created these nas this national currency, a huge move forward. So let's look at some common threads that link the past to the present. So what we've seen, not only in this country, but in Europe, is that countries often need to generate money to pay for wars. That's been the past. But now it mainly seems to be that countries often need to generate money to pay for social benefits. And so that seems to be the present. This leads to either, high, either higher taxes or debt issuance or the printing of money. It helps if the government has a central bank to help buy up the debt as Hamilton initiated. The point is, with a treasury and a federal government, they can issue, they can try to impose higher taxes, but the people won't stand for it generally. You can try to issue debt, but if there's not a big demand for the debt and people don't have confidence in the government that it'll pay back the debt, that doesn't really work. So what do governments do? They end up printing money to pay for things. And when you print money, you increase the money supply, which is a supply, and the value of that money drops off. What happens is prices go up, and you're not any better off. In fact, you're worse off because now you have inflation, and you got to stamp that inflation out because people have these this idea that prices are going to continue to go up, and they expect it. So even when the money supply falls initially, there's no change in, in people's ex inflation expectations. So it becomes quite a difficult matter to deal with, and that's something we'll talk about later in this course also. So important distinctions in the U.S. The U.S. Treasury handles the finances of the government and oversees its currency and debt issuance. Okay? The central bank, which is now the Federal Reserve, is a bank of the banks. It manages commercial banks, the money supply interest rates, and is responsible for price stability, which means basically low inflation, and the unemployment rate. So I just wanted to make those distinctions clear that there's a difference between the U.S. Treasury and the central bank. Most of this course deals with banking and central banks and also shadow banks, which are kind of cool that have popped up in the past 20 years. And some other financial institutions, the Treasury 
you know, it's there, but it's not a huge part of this course. Now, Hamilton was the first Treasury Secretary of the U.S. and developed its responsibilities. He also engineered the first central bank. So what he did in the very beginning of this country was he commingled and entangled the two. And eventually we, we sorted that out so that there would be a more independent U.S. Treasury and more, more importantly, an independent central bank, another topic that we're going to hit later on in this course. So now... Recent in recent decades, you know, barring the the Great Recession we had in 2008, 9, and 10, and then the coronavirus, our financial and economic environment is way more stable than colonial times. Believe it or not, so people would might have a hard time seeing that. But after you listen to this video and look at monetary history and economic history of this country, you realize we're in pretty good economic times. So let me show you. So here's real GDP from 1947 to 2020. And you see it ramping up fairly nicely. Look at the distance and the space between the gray bars. So the gray bars are recessions. And we had, you know, pretty long periods of no recession, no recession, which was basically economic growth. So when you see real GDP, it's adjusted for inflation, backed out the effects of inflation, and you see that upward trend. That's strong economic growth, in, and that implies a high standard of living when you see good growth like that. And then, so what you see is, look carefully now, look carefully at the bars. You see every time we hit a bar, a recession, you see economic growth dropping off. And so that's basically the definition of a, a recession. The somewhat unofficial definition is two negative quarters of GDP growth. And so that's that's what those bars basically represent, approximately. It's not as easy uh, as it sounds. There's more to it than that, than just two quarters of negative GDP growth. But that's basically, most of these bars are consistent with that idea, as you see. And so you look at the Great Recession, 2008, 9, and 10, and you look at that big drop in GDP. The output dropped off. In fact, you know, look at the trend. The trend remains the same, basically, the same upward slope overall, but the whole real GDP output line has shifted down. And now look what it did in 2020 because of the coronavirus. It dropped off significantly down. And so what we hope is that GDP continues the same upward trend just at a lower level. I think that's how you should think of it. We'll be at a lower level, but hopefully we have the same growth rate as we had in the past. So now what we also want to talk about is inflation. Inflation since, since the mid-1980s has become tame. So here's the consumer price index. Think of this as what a basket of goods would cost. And the only thing that changes is the basket of goods prices. So you buy the exact same goods every year, and it's a weighted average of, of the basket of different goods. It's really important that you understand it's the exact same goods there's no switching. There's no switching to a cheaper brand. It's the exact quantity and quality. And so there you see the prices relatively flat all the way up until 1970s. Then you can see in, in the early seven, in well, around 1974, we got whacked with an OPEC oil shock. Price of oil went up. And so you can see, you can see the ramp up in the trend line of that consumer price index in around 1974. Even during a, you know, during a recession that happened. That's because oil prices went up and oil is, is in everything, basically. And so it tends to raise prices. And so you see even more inflation and an even more ramp up there in the level in the late 1970s. And finally, it flattens out a bit since then. And we're in a much better shape. So the inflation rate, which is the growth rate of this line. So this line has a growth rate. And here is the growth rate. So you see the growth rate now in 2020 is pretty good. It's, it's almost zero, and it's been hovering around 2% on average for a bunch of years. Now take a look. Go back to the 1950s. You see it's bouncing around a bit, but really not that bad. You're only looking at one point of a high at 10%, or two points there, high at 10%. Relatively stable all the way up until the early 1970s where we ran into bouts of what we consider to be high inflation, not hyperinflation, but just high inflation. And then Paul Volcker, the central bank chairman, 
in the early 1980s and late 70s, he restricted the money supply significantly and brought the inflation rate down. So we went from about 15% all the way down to 2.5% at some points there. That was because of a restriction in the money supply. So if you reduce the money supply, it does the opposite of printing too much money. You print too much money, you get higher prices. If you restrict the amount of money in the economy, prices tend to drop off. Prices of goods and services. In this summary, I skimmed the surface of monetary history. I mostly hit on the end result, and I can't simply, I, I just can't do it justice in a handful of slides. What's missing, and I've mentioned this before, is there's there's a huge, rich debate surrounding all of these issues that I've talked about, which I kind of just glossed over. And so if you read the history books on this, you'll get, you know, you'll get more detail on what was going on and what, was the, what the thinking was. This course touches on contemporary issues and debate of our financial system. However, you will find most of the discussions have deep roots in his. So as I said before in this earlier on in these slides, this course touches on contemporary issues in financial markets and institutions and the debate that goes on right today. However, you'll find that most of the debates and the discussions that we'll talk about now, they have roots, deep roots in history. We've been there before. It's just that things pop up over and over again. So our objective is not history, but we have to look at history to understand to where we are today. There's something, what's important to know is from this history, you know, and so I went back to the 1600s and told you all these problems associated with banks. There's something different about banks. They're not ordinary businesses. You can't look at them as a manufacturer or a retail or a technology firm. Banks end up creating the money supply. They multiply deposits, and which we'll have a lot to talk about later on in this course. And what they end up doing is they end up creating systematic risk just naturally. And so, like I said, we need a strong financial system to have a strong economy. You just can't have a strong economy without a good financial system. But a good financial system, it seems, no matter what we do, always has systemic risk in it. And that's, the con that, that's been the difficulty for hundreds of years, is how to have a strong banking system and a financial system without the systemic risk. So far, we haven't figured that out. But we're getting, we're getting there, and that's what this course will talk about. So let's talk about the three functions of money. And the three functions of money are the unit of account, means of payment, and the store of value. The unit of account works like this. The concept works like this. Think of the idea of unit of account like this. Think about it. When you go to stores, you go walking down the aisle, you see a list of prices, and they're in dollars, right? That's a unit of account. You go to a restaurant, you look at the menu, and the prices are listed there. They're, they're listing everything in a unit of account. Everything's measured in dollars. That's what we mean by a unit of account. The concept of the unit of account is far more valuable to the economy than you might suspect. When you do not have a unit of account, you're going to have to deal with n times n minus 1 divided by 2 relative prices. That seems really abstract. Let me make some sense out of that idea. So, for example, let's do, let's make a matrix here. If you had just three items in the economy, let's just do three, and you had, let's see, price of apples, the price of bananas, and the price of cantaloupe, apples, bananas, and cantaloupe, and you made a matrix like this. And so the main diagonal, you can eliminate the main diagonal because apples, the apples, and bananas, the bananas, well, obviously, they trade for the same same prices, so you, you ignore that. So basically, you have a matrix, and the matrix is, in this case, the matrix is three columns and three rows, and let's just make that N, so general. N by N, so this would be nine. There would be nine boxes in here, but we have to subtract out the main diagonal because that doesn't give us any information about prices. You don't have to keep track of the price of apples relative to apples. And the other thing is, we need to divide this whole equation by 2, this whole formula by 2, because the price of apples to bananas is the same as bananas to apples. This is the inverse of the other. So basically, you would have to keep track of n times n minus 1 divided by 2 relative prices in the economy. 
to transact. And that would be extremely cumbersome. Just think of 100 items. And most people over a period of a, of a year, say, buy far more than 100 different types of items. So if you had 100, N was 100 different items, you'd have 100 times 99 divided by 2. You'd have 4,950 different relative prices to keep track of. You don't have to worry about that, at least to, not, to that extent. If you have a unit of account like the dollar, if you have a unit of account like the dollar, you only have to worry about 100 prices because you have 100 items there. So having a unit of account keeps things really simple. Now the means of payment basically says that, look, people transact in this money and they will accept, readily accept it in transactions. So that's what we sometimes call it a medium of exchange. It's a convenient medium of exchange. It prevents us from having to barter and trade chickens for beef. And the other important thing is that a function of money should have a store of value. So if you have a dollar today, it's roughly worth a dollar next year or a couple of years from now. Now, we may have inflation and it may decay a little bit, but you still have a store of value from one year to the next. In today's world, that's, that's a fairly good assumption. Now, if these three functions break down, then the economy tends to break down. And in colonial times, and for many years afterwards, we had a monetary system that did not function, and the economy reflected it. Why didn't it function right? Well, let's look at these three functions of money more carefully. Let's look at when we have a low inflation environment, say 2% per year, now let's see what happens when we have really high inflation, hyperinflation. Now, I don't think we had hyperinflation, and you know the definition of hyperinflation varies, but we didn't, I, I, we didn't have hyperinflation earlier in this country. We had very high inflation at times, for sure. But let's compare and contrast the two extremes, because sometimes it's easier to look at extremes and to imagine how things would work. So let's look at the unit of account. So under low inflation, Right, at 2% per year, the unit of account stays intact. People will always have their menus in dollars. You go down the aisles and you look at the shelves and things will be priced in terms of dollars. You go to the internet, you'll see things priced in dollars. But when you have hyperinflation, the unit of account falls apart. It becomes erratic. People have trouble determining the value of goods with money. So when you have hyperinflation and it's increasing significantly, you really don't know how much it's worth. And so people start to lose confidence in it. And what they do is they start scrambling for other units of account. So people begin to measure value with foreign currency. So in, in this country, in colonial times, we looked at European coins because European coins were much more stable than American dollars and American money. More recently, if you look at Venezuela and the fact that they had hyperinflation, what did they do? They started using dollars to conduct business because the dollar was stable. They lost complete confidence in, in their own currency. And so with hyperinflation, like I said before, people tend to barter. Now, let's look at the means of payment. In a low inflationary environment, that stays intact. People readily accept currency for payment. But when you have hyperinflation, the means of payment falls off. People become reluctant to accept currency for payment. And so what do they do? Again, they go back to bartering, which is very inefficient. That double coincidence at once is a huge problem with bartering. Then let's look at the store of value. So if you have a store of value at a 2% inflation rate, well, it's decaying a little bit at 2% per year. That's not a very hard thing to, to deal with. Most people have no problems with a 2% inflation rate or so. Even 3% people don't, don't have a problem with it. In fact, I can tell you back in the, in the early 90s when we had a 5% inflation rate, we thought that was great. Uh, today's world, we might look at that as a little, being a little high. Now, in hyperinflation, the store of value just drops off. It just drops off tremendously. So when you get paper money, I mean, first of all, you don't want to get paper money if you transact. And if you do, you want to get rid of it as soon as possible because the longer you hold on to it, the more the value erodes. Okay, so that's three functions of money by comparing and contrast the low inflation environment with a high inflation environment. 
Now let's look at Bitcoin because Bitcoin's been advertised to be an alternative to government-based money. For some reason, people have problems with the fact that we have a government-based money, and that's basically money around the world is government-based for the most part. And so Bitcoin was introduced a few years back. You can see Bitcoin, look at the, the you know, y-axis on the left there, pretty small, close to zero when it started out. It ramped up to $20,000 per coin and then came down significantly. And so you got to ask yourself, okay, if you look at that, burn that chart into your memory there and ask yourself, back up a second and say, well, is, is Bitcoin a good unit of account? Well, let me ask you this. When you travel and you go to stores and you go to the internet and you go to restaurants, do you see prices in terms of Bitcoin? I don't see it. In fact, I can't ever remember seeing it. I don't look for it, but I don't remember seeing it either. So it doesn't seem like Bitcoin's a good unit of account there in terms of a function of money. Then is it used as a means of a, a payment? Do people readily accept Bitcoin? Not that I know of. There are some, there must be some uh, transactions done. I believe there are transactions done, but by and large, you're not going to see that transactions are not conducted in Bitcoin. It's kind of rare for most people. Then is it, is it a store of value? Well, let me tell you, look at this. Is it a good store of value if you bought it at 20 and it went down to, to $4,000 there? Not really a good store of value. Look how unstable it is. So why would you want to go into Bitcoin instead of the U.S. dollar, which is far more stable than what it can buy? So again, here's our history. Here's the history of money and our aggregate price level. It's still calmer because, look, we're going from like 70 up to 200 at one point on this axis. We're not going up to 20,000 in terms of a price level. So it's more stable. Uh, this this. Bitcoin is more unstable than our aggregate price level for sure. Now what we want to do is let's look at the money supply for a moment. We'll have a lot more to say about the money supply, but we want to first introduce what we mean by the supply of money, at least in today's terms. So we have M1 and we have M2. M1 is kind of moved off to the side and we use M2. These are called money aggregates, M1 and M2. So here we have it in billions. So basically, at the bottom there, you look at M2 total, it's basically $18 trillion that we have in M2 money supply. But before we get to this M2, let's look at M1. So M1 is near money. And what do we mean by near money? Well, it's currency in circulation, which is about $2 trillion. Most of it's not in this country. Most of that currency in circulation is floating around the rest of the world that has problems with their own currencies, like Venezuela. So you see a lot of $100, $100 bills floating around in the rest of the world. It's really not in circulation in the U.S. And if you do see it in circulation in the U.S., a lot of it's used for illegal transactions because people don't want to have a record of transactions using credit cards and other electronic transfers. They tend to deal with transactions using currency instead. Now, demand deposits, which are basically checking deposits, so it's important to realize that you can pull your money out of a bank on demand, and they have to give you your money on demand. That's why they're called demand deposits, which are checking accounts. And we got about $2.3 trillion wrapped up in that. We have other checkable deposits where you can write checks off of. It, you may not be able to get your money immediately, or there may be some type of restriction on the size of the check. But that's what we mean by other checkable deposits. There's traveler's checks, which have been recently discontinued, and they were only a couple billion dollars. You know, get, it gets lost in rounding when you're dealing with trillions. So you can ignore the traveler's checks. They just don't, people just don't use them anymore. Now, M2 is equal to M1, all that near money, plus small denominated time deposits. These are basically certificates of deposit, you know, like a three-month, four-month, six-month, one-year deposits you put in financial institutions, and you tie, basically tie your money up. Now, you generally don't have access to that money immediately if you want to withdraw, and you'll have to pay a penalty. So that's why they're not quite near money, but they're still considered money according to M2 definitions. Now, there's also savings deposits and money market deposit accounts. 
So we'll talk about what money market deposit accounts are much more later in this course. And it's basically a, a, an account at a bank that pays a variable low interest rate because it's short-term deposits. You know, you can pull your money out pretty quickly in there. Well, it turns out since they have variable rates, there's, you know, like 11 trillion wrapped up in there. Uh, they can seem to be kind of popular. We you put your money in a, in a checking deposit, it's convenient because you can get your money out instantly, but you're not going to get any interest rate on that. And so in today's world where we have a lot of uncertainty around COVID, uh, a lot of money is moved into, into money market deposits and saving deposits accounts. And then, too, basically is ramped up significantly, as I'll show you in a second. Then there's also retail money market mutual fund shares. These are outside of the banks. These are, well, some people might consider them sh early shadow banks that started up in the early 1970s. We'll talk about that as a com competitor to the banks. So if you want to deposit your money and get a decent rate of return, retail money market mutual funds are an interesting alternative. Like I said, we'll talk about that later. Now let's look at an actual graph of M2 money supply. So there it is since the 1960s, slowly ramping up. And then we had a strong economic growth in um, late 1990s. And you can see that ramping up. And so the money supply has ramped up significantly, despite the fact that we haven't had that much inflation. So this is a ramp up that's, that's moderate growth. So you have moderate growth. We didn't really have that much inflation. Now, what, I, what I'm worried about and other people worried, worried about is the implications down the road of that big spike. That's a 20% spike in a matter of a month or two or so. And that's a huge spike in the money supply. So normally, like we saw with history, you have a spike in the money supply. You're going to get a spike in inflation unless something counteracts it. Now, that's the question. How is that going to be counteracted if the money supply causes that inflation? Now, the question becomes, you know, is there a difference between colonial times and, and the current times? Well, it depends on the situation. A lot of times, the money supply was ramped up in a war. So you had a really hyperactive economy, plus the money supply increased. It's hyperactive because so much activity was going on. The, the to produce supplies for the war. Well, we're not in a war, and so the economy has actually dropped down a bit, as we saw earlier, in, because of the coronavirus. So that's going to help offset the implications associated with this spike in the money supply. So the, you know, we'll wait and see. We're going to watch carefully what happens to the inflation rate over time in this country.